Yo, what's going on, you all? Uh, we are back again. This is my 10th stream, but I told you all last week I would be coming back with a name. So here it is. Everybody, this is now the Music Money Makeover Show, all right? All right, so every week we will be back with the Music Money Makeover Show. So you all will be able to see all of the stuff that I've been working on. I'll be putting it online. I'll be putting all the articles online, all the recaps online, and the audio from this show will now be in podcast form. That is coming soon. So sometimes things take a little bit of development, but since everybody is slowly joining in, I'm just gonna jump into the show. So today we're talking about the basics of music publishing, all right? For the last couple weeks, um, pre the show title, we've been talking about the ins and outs of production contracts and things like that. But this week I wanna delve into the basics of how a publishing operation works, okay? And I, I feel it's imperative for artists to understand how the publishing industry works first before they jump into getting publishing deals, right? Because everybody wants to be in this music industry and you hear these things about these different deals that you should probably get. But today I wanna to explain what actually happens in a publishing company that can benefit you at the stage that you're at. Remember, we're talking about do-it-yourself artists, okay? That's what we're working on Instagram and Facebook and everybody out there. We're talking about do-it-yourself artists, okay? So let me jump into it, all right? So the first, the first thing for a music publisher to do, and this is the first activity, is they're promoting and licensing the performance and publication of musical compositions, okay? I'm gonna delve into how this has changed from the past until now, but as far as it goes today, music publishers promote and they license uh, performance and publication of the music composition, okay? This is important for you because as an independent artist, you're gonna do only so much that, you know, as you can with promoting you yourself as an artist, as, as the whole, we're talking about the whole picture here, and you're working on yourself in that promotion aspect. Meanwhile, the publisher is working on the promotion of your songs, not necessarily your records, but they go hand in hand with the record company. The publisher will want to hop in and exploit these songs, okay? So you as an artist, you can worry about selling yourself, and then the publisher can worry about selling the songs. That's like getting stuff in TV and film, getting stuff you know, in radio spots, not radio string uh, uh, spins, but just advertisement spots, getting stuff on advertisements, okay? Getting your music in print form, getting your music in lyric form and exploiting the lyrics of the song, putting you know these things on t-shirts and whatever paraphernalia that you can put pieces of this song on to generate a publishing stream. That's what the publisher is doing. Now, like I said before, the publisher's promotion of the song can sometimes borderline what the record label is doing. And this is why, like I said last week, that the record label will want to keep the publishing in-house, okay? They wanna do it because it keeps it keeps accounting easy for them and they can kind of pool all the money together. When you have the record label do these things like the pub, take care of the publishing for you in-house, it tends to it tends to cloud up what you're doing for um, for certain things when it comes to the song, right? Because the record label doesn't necessarily have enough people in-house to handle these tasks these days. And the only reason why they want to put the publishing in-house is mainly for the administration duties. This takes money, to me, in my opinion, out of your pocket because they can do what they want with those, like I was saying the last two weeks, with those mechanical royalties, all right? So I don't want to go on a soapbox here, but I do want to stress that what the publisher does with the promotion, not like the copyrights, but the promotion of the song can sometimes go hand in hand with what the record label is doing. The promotion aspects of them, of that operation looks very similar, okay? Now, 
because of the streaming and all this stuff that's going on, music publishing to me is the future, right? You all know, I have a few of you, you know, on the stream now between Facebook and Instagram, you all know how it goes when you stream your songs, you get that 0 .003 pennies per stream and nobody, everybody's in an uproar about it. And, but see, this is what the publishing industry has been seeing for years. Publishing is that slow, consistent money, all right? Record companies get that fast cash, really, really fast, all right? But the publishing industry, we, we, they, haven't, they haven't really ran into any roadblocks because they've been seeing this for years. They've been collecting pennies for years. Everybody calls the publishing game the pennies game. But now, since the whole landscape is a pennies game, now we have to think, okay, we have to think like a publisher. How do we set ourselves up to continue getting this long money for the long run? Everything that you do now is a long-term game at this point. There is no more short, we hit, we hit it out the gate and we get all the streams up front. You wanna build for, of course, you're gonna have that explosion out the gate on a project, but you also wanna build for the long game. And that comes with the artist being promoted properly. That comes with the song consistently being promoted properly. And it also comes with the record being promoted properly. And everybody is now on this same playing field. Okay? So what you all are witnessing is a just like a mass global consolidation. Granted, this has been going on for years, but since the 60s, we kind of see this consolidation just happen. Everything just start crunch, it starts crunching into one. And your iPhone is a key element of that. Like you, you see how everything consolidates into this iPhone. And if everything is doing that into the phone, you better believe all other industries are doing that. Okay. All right. So, you know, now we have that covered. We got the basic operation down. Let me, let me address the second responsibility of a publisher. All right administration administration is one of the key responsibilities of music publishers that will determine a successful publisher all right now i see a lot of pop-up publishers that come in right i mean and and everybody everybody has to start somewhere you have new publishing houses that start up you have playlisters that start something you have sync licensors that start something you have just flat out uh, publisher administrators that start something, all right? But they all seem to have an administration component to them in these separate functions, all right? So without proper administration, the tasks that need to be handled and accounted for, they fall astray. People forget about administration. Once the album comes out, they it just, it's like amnesia, it just goes away. And people totally forget about this thing. Administration is something that you cannot forget about. Even if you are a self-published artist, you have to really consider this. And then this is one, and, and like, I don't want to say this, this is one of the key points where artists tend to fail and then they say, hey, I got too much going on. I need to publish an administrator. All right. Now, two weeks ago or the last two weeks, I've been explaining how you can properly self-publish yourself. I'll chime in right here, all right? To make yourself self-published yourself, what you wanna do is you wanna have an account with BMI, like I've been saying, ASCAP, whatever your PRO is, Harry Fox, Music Reports, um, um, Sound Exchange, and then you have your distributor, and this takes care of everything, right? Okay, by yourself, this is fine. This is fine, well, and dandy by yourself, but let's say you have to split something with somebody and they don't have their stuff together, but you need their stuff on file to get your money. I'm, I'm keep it frank. You can't get your money from your PRO. Let's say if you and Big Mike and them down the street do a song together, and nobody sent their splits in, or you can't you can't just put your split in and register it with the PRO to get your money. This is where it becomes a problem, and then this is where people say, "Oh man, you know what? I." Man, we need to get either an administrator just to handle the publishing on this song or something because I need my money. 
And I can't wait on Juju and them, you know, Big Roro and all of them to get their stuff together. And so you want to get a mediator, someone besides yourself, to hop in and handle the administration on this song. What's going on, people joining in to the uh, stream on Instagram and Facebook? How y'all people doing? All right. So anyway, let's uh, let's keep going. So the departments of the administration side looks like this. So you have the copyright administration. You have the licensing that handles your television and film and whatnot. And like, and I'll dis discuss later getting stuff into greeting cards, like putting songs into Sesame Street characters, you know, putting all this, putting music in places where they, where it wouldn't necessarily go. That means video games, games on the iPhone, all types of stuff where you can get publishing money from licensing. Licensing is a very vast catalog, category of, of a, a places where you can just put music, all right? I mean, music goes in, like, I, like I've been saying before, it goes in retail stores, all right? Um, music can go in, I don't know, I don't know, it could be some type of, some t-shirt for some kid, right? And you just press a button and the song plays on the t-shirt, that's publishing money. All right. Even even with the lyrics, like I said, you put you put lyrics on a T-shirt that's publishing money to the publisher. You know, they need a piece that's print money. And that's one of the things that I have in here as well. All right. Legal affairs. That's a given. You know, that's making sure everything is legal, making sure you're not missing any loopholes or whatever like that. Like I said before, royalty accounting and your international money. International money has to be collected. So proper registration has to be done. All right, you don't necessarily need a sub publisher to get your international money because it will flow over as long as your American registrations are done correctly. So don't don't panic about that. Your money will come. It'll just come a little bit slow, but it'll be there. All right. So just to wrap that up, administration is a when you get it right, when you know all your registration. Uh, I should say this before I even say this statement. Administration, I should say registration, is a set and forget process. Once all the stuff is registered, that's the first part of the administration task. Once that's set, once your registrations on all the sites are done, you're cool, all right? Accounting is the back end process of this whole administration function. You know, terrible accounting, you know, you lose money. Okay, you need to make sure that people can account for all the money that comes in to you. Licensing, like we said, it's an active and passive department for the fact that licenses have to be received as well as pursued. Legal affairs, like I said, was given. Um, and let's say if we dig into this international department, they will exploit your stuff overseas. That's the whole point. That's not only to collect from overseas, but let's say if your market for, let's say if you're doing hip hop music, right? But it's lo-fi. Lo-fi is kind of like, it just got big in America. But since the 2000s, it was big on the West Coast and in China and Japan and Korea. That's where lo-fi music was popping at first. So you would want somebody over in Japan and China and Korea to exploit your music over there. That's the big lo-fi capital, West Coast, and in Asia. All right. So let me address this uh, this royalty account. Uh, and by the way, you all can drop questions and whatnot in the comment sections. It, uh, it doesn't matter to me. I'll take care of those answers. And don't forget, you all can follow me at Casey Graham underscore 24. And you can uh, follow me on Facebook uh, at Casey Graham. I'm in there. I pretty much look like what I have on right now. A white shirt and this curly hair. Anyway. All right, so paying these songwriters their share of the collected income, this royalty accounting that I'm talking about, right? And just for everybody that's coming in on Facebook, this is solely about the functionings of a publishing company, all right? Now, like I said, you may be able to do this on your own with one or two writers, but if you have a song that just so happens to pick up steam, Royalty accounting services are necessary and they cost a little bit of money. All right. And this is where your publishing company comes in. But, you know, it has to be done. If you so choose to sign up with a publishing company that doesn't do this, or if you talk to someone who signed with a publishing company that you're thinking about signing with, 
just ask them some questions and say, hey man, how such and such? Have they, you know, proven themselves to you? Have you felt okay about their accounting? Have you have you had any issues? You always want to do your due diligence because some people just do not account correctly for the money. All right? So I just want to stress that to you all that you want to kind of do your fact checking with any publishing company that you're attempting to get in line with. All right. So now, now that you understand that these are kind of the key administration roles, let's talk about how the money will flow to your pocket as a writer. Okay. Because even if you're self published, this still applies to you. Music publishing money is paid to the writer via a publishing company. That's it. That's it. Everything that you collect, money for lyrics, money for print, money for, except for money for performance, money for, uh, uh, you know, webcasting and all this stuff like that, the performance of that, monies for uh, streaming, all of this stuff has to come directly through the publishing company, the mechanicals, all of that. Then the share that is owed to the writer is paid out of the production, I mean, the publishing company to the writer over here. That's how it works. The only way it's different is in America is if you're with the PRO and you have a writer's account and a publisher's account and they pay to them separately. But everywhere else, all this money is paid into a publishing account. That's why you want to have this LLC set up, all right? This LLC is going to serve the purpose to handle all of this cash flow that you'll be getting, okay? All right, so I just want you to keep that in mind. So now that we have kind of the structure out of the way, let me talk about the categories of the sizes of these behemoths that you want to get involved with. Now, since we're all talking about do-it-yourself artists, you got a major worldwide publisher where you don't really, as a do-it-yourself artist, you don't necessarily need that. Then you have an independent music publisher. And sometimes these independent publishers can be signed up with major labels to take care of their international royalty streams, okay? You also have uh, you yourself as being the last one, which is a self-published songwriter. Right. If you do everything right, your registration right, and you don't plan on administering anyone's publishing, though you may come across that when you get frustrated and you can't get all your money, you may consider want to consider signing up with the independent publisher. Okay, somebody to call on these people and to get your money into your pocket. All right, but that's those are the three: worldwide, independent, and self-publishing. One, two, three. Okay. Your major sources of income for a publisher are go- it's going to be this. Okay. Sound recordings, public performance, uh, movies, television, streaming video content that's online, whether it's social media or it's um, YouTube, YouTube Red, um, whether it's. Um, Let's see, we got, I'm drawing a blank, Hulu, Netflix, all of that, and advertising. Your secondary stuff would be your print music, your foreign sub-publishing, your radio programs, this is web, webcast, satellite, and consumer products that's gonna use your music. Like I said, Tickle Me Elmo's and, and you know Har- Hallmark greeting cards, things like this, all right? Now, emerging sources, would be licensing on social media platforms, all right? Because even though, you know, why well, take that back? Well, no, I'll say that. Even though I said social media before, this is still an emerging category where in social media, they're still trying to figure out what the licensing terms will look like, okay? What will this look like for, um, music creators how how will this licensing look when we talk about something called micro licensing which i don't feel that that system is necessarily perfected yet even though it works 
it doesn't protect the songwriter because of people like YouTube with content ID. YouTube content ID doesn't necessarily take care of the content creator and the music creator because it, it kind of punishes the content creator from making the money. But then at the same time for the music creator, they don't actually get the opportunity to sometimes get in certain videos, okay? And that, to me, it loses me. I'm not, it's, it's still a big mix up. Like I said, this is emerging, all right? And then the new thing, the new thing that's coming is licensing and podcasts. I see it coming, you know, um, Spotify just bought Anchor for podcasts. So music and podcasts is on the way and I'm excited to see how that's gonna turn out. All right, so a lot of this is my thoughts, you know, on things, but with all of these departments and publishing companies, things, you know, indie writers, they're like getting confused. And there's so many services out there. Like I said before, sync licensing, administration, royalty accounting, promotion. Like these are the four main categories that get split apart when, it, when we're talking about publishers, okay? Now, by the time you sign up with all of these services, you will have essentially created a co-publishing situation where you, you, know, you do the 50-50 and all that stuff for your music. The reason why I say that is because for the royalty accounting, they're gonna take a percentage. For the administration, they're gonna take a percentage. For the sync licensing, which has been around since the 80s, uh, like sync licensing services, they're gonna take a percentage. And then for the promotion, like these new playlisters that are out there, they're gonna take a percentage as well. So by the time you sign up with all of these services, they will have actually already taken the amount of money that it would have taken if you were signed up with, let's say, a major independent publisher. Now, you might not want to do all of them. You might not need to do all of them, okay? You might actually just want to do sync licensing, which I think is the better of the two because, I mean, of the of the three or four, because it takes care of a serious issue that when people want stuff in TV, film, radio spots, advertisement, they have taken care of the bulk of the, of the promotion that you need. The only thing that you're missing in promotion when it comes to a do-it-yourself artist really is the playlisting. We're talking about, I'm not, now, now, to clear this up, I'm not talking about a record company. I'm only talking about a publishing company. Okay, that's that's totally it, all right? So, so I, I, I wanna keep that clear, all right? If you got any questions, you all, drop them in the comment section um, and I will jump right on those questions. And you can also DM me or message me after the show is over. I'll take questions there, all right? So um, let me just give you a quick breakdown of how this publishing industry came into America, all right? Like I said, I do this, I do this every week for you all. I'm researching stuff to make sure you have the greatest meat and potatoes when it comes to this music business game. I'm teaching you game every week, you know what I'm saying? And I feel that everybody needs this. If you're gonna play ball in this music industry, you need to know what you're up against. Don't just start making music and say, this is it, this is all I'm gonna do. No, if this is your career, you should treat it just like someone going to college and you know getting a degree for their career, all right? So, quick story of America's publishing industry. 1793, Benjamin Carr establishes the first music publishing company in the US. 1893, uh, a song called After the Ball, written by Charles K. Harris, becomes the first song to sell a million copies. We're talking about 1893. 1892, Gussie L. Davis, the first Negro songwriter, is brought into the American consciousness. Now, I'm not, that's not to say that a lot of black people haven't written songs. Sure they have. But this is the first guy that, that comes into the American consciousness. And I believe he sold a million copies of, of his songs, or one of his songs as well. All right. Tom B. Harms, 1892, becomes the first publisher to discover the profitability of putting music into Broadway shows. 1894, the first music video. That's right, 1894, the first music video 
was made for a song called Lost Little Child in Brooklyn, New York. All right, 1900, all music publishing firms started establishing themselves on 28th Street between 5th and Broadway, now known as Tin Pan Alley, all right? Now, what is Tin Pan Alley? Most of you all who have, all you need to know about the music business, Tin Pan Alley was a place in New York City where all the publishers would have offices kind of where they are now, kind of like where the CBS building is in New York, right right there on Broadway, Fifth Ave and all that. And they would have song pluggers. Like nowadays you have song pluggers, they'll take a song that a writer wrote and try to go hook up with another artist to get it sold. Back in the day, you had to have a piano player play these songs. And so in Tin Pan Alley, all the piano players would be blaring out of the windows playing songs for someone else to buy the song right, to audition the song, all right, you had to be a great, excellent sight reader on piano to become one of these piano players. 1901, Tom B. Harms Company, with the help of Max Dreyfus, began lifting songs from Broadway plays, like, hmm, these songs in these Broadway plays are kind of cool, man, we should, we could make some money off of this, yeah, let's do it. All right, 1908, Francis Day and Hunter Incorporated ties Britain publishers with American publishers for the first time. The first self-publishing deal goes down in 1908. 1929, right, I'm just fast forward. I have a lot of stuff here, but 1929, Jack Warner. You all might know that name, Jack Warner from Warner Brothers Pictures. He foresees the importance of music and film and purchases the catalogs of M. Whitmark and Sons, Remit Music Corp, and Max Dreyfus Incorporated, Harms Incorporated, all right, of, of Harms Incorporated, all right? And this is when the music industry infiltrated the music industry. Everything changed at that point. Brand new game, brand new day, everything changes at this point, all right? So let me step aside real quick. So these song pluggers playing on piano back in the day in Tin Pan Alley, they would play in Macy's department store, which is a rigid, this is a, a fact that I saw that said, made me say, hmm, that must be the reason for the pianos still sitting in Macy's, like in some of the more affluent sides of town where they have this auto playing piano. And it's to reminisce, reminiscent of the days where song pluggers would go to Macy's to audition songs and they would sell them outright, all right? So that's a little key, little key thing there. Okay, so now uh, let me jump into a little bit more, and then we'll we'll uh, I'll open up the floor for questions. All right. So this, the last thing I want to tackle is managers at publishing firms. Okay. Now these managers or A and Rs, so to speak, uh, would go out and find you all. They're, they're looking for you online. They're looking for the next hot single that blows up on Instagram in a meme. They're looking for anything that old school wise used to be radio was buzzing in a certain region. They're looking for the next hottest thing that's going on and they're going to sign it up and they're going to exploit it to the fullest extent. That's pretty much what they're doing. The ultimate goal is to help this writer or artist that they sign up to a publishing deal to find a record deal. All right, that's the ultimate goal because they want to achieve maximum exploitation of the song. All right, so when you get a little buzz going, there are people swarming and looking for you. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It's just that they foresee the money that you could make and they could make if they helped you out with this publishing deal. The deal has to be good. Publishing deals are not always bad, but you should always look them over with an attorney because you want to make sure that it's not taking so much ownership from you that you will never see any money down the line. All right. Never take more than what you can give back. Sometimes a lot of times when people do these publishing deals from anywhere from 50,000 to $250,000, it's like Master P said, like, if you are going to give me $10 million for my deal, how much is my music really worth? So if you're going to give me 250,000, how much is my music really worth? It might be worth it to take, like I've been saying, take way less and so you can receive way more down the line. All right. So 
because these managers or a and r's at these publishing firms because they must learn to anticipate new trends you as a writer i'm not now i'm not talking about artists i'm talking about as writers as the climate changes you either force the climate to change or you change with the climate because if you're stuck writing songs from 10 years ago in the style of 10 years ago your songs won't sell as a music from a music publisher. If you stay with current day, then you can sell more songs. You stay with current day producers. You stay with the next of the next of who's hot. This is how you get your song sold when you're with the publisher. If you don't, if you refuse to change and you're old school with it, your publishing deal is going to go down because you can't keep up. You're like, oh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a purist. Purists don't work in this business. It's what's happening today that works. Can you get with it? Okay. Now, like I said before, these managers are online. These managers are looking for artists online, wherever they can find them. And nowadays, the hottest spots, if you all know, is TikTok. Like TikTok is the hottest thing going, right? Creating memes to exploit your works is where it is today. Music videos, who? But that's only if like you need it for extra promo. I say one music video, and you got to get out here doing these memes. Like really, that's what it is, and that's how a lot of songs are breaking. That's how Lil Nas X broke. That's how the uh, Blanco Brown broke, which is viral videos of user-generated content. That's it. User-generated content will break your records. All that other stuff. Like you go from the, you go from online with user generated content, even if, you know some of you rappers, even with the strippers, strippers are doing their thing online because they make a lot of money online doing what they do with your record, and then that actually goes onto the internet and people are like where this song coming from, all right? And you're creating these online pieces of content. You're creating, you know, you have a just a three second snip of your song. Somebody could be on a boat or something, and it's the clip is hot. The video on the clip is, it's like, it's, it's infatuating to your eye and you listening to the song and you're saying, Hey, this is a dope song. What song is this? Like, I don't, you might remember this song was from 2015, but two years later, there were a bunch of memes that popped out of nowhere. And the song, it went, it had a little melody. It was like, like they would freeze frame the video and it would just be jerking back and forth. It was like, um, the song went like, that. It was like an EDM song. And it was a bunch of memes that popped out of nowhere. And that I, I had to Shazam the song. It was funny. The memes were funny. And the streams climbed on that song. Because they created these memes for the song. Just a little snip of the song. And that's how you're breaking records today. More so than the club, the radio, TV. You know, you have to gather people around the TV to break a song. Like it has to be a, a massive audience for someone to hear a song and say, yes, the only way a song gets broken on TV is if it's in the beginning or it's at the end of the show. Everything else in between, the scene has to severely matter. OK, like it has to really matter. All right. So like I said, social media is where it is. All right. Everything has a landscape in this business. All right. Landscape is that space that you're looking for to advertise your true self, talents, goods, services, all that. Okay. Whatever you want to exploit. All right. The alternative to this is today's independent record labels. All right. These operations can be achieved fairly simple with a playlister an administration department and a creative department in house with marketing and publicity taken care of as a subcontracted service. Okay, because most of the stuff you can handle with three people that understand about efficiency and they understand the market of today. Okay, um, I would even go so far to say this, that social media was the landscape and I'm going to jump out five years and the new landscape is audio recognition, artificial intelligence augmented reality and blockchain technology you all will see this coming in and this will be the new the new form of the landscape 
where artists will break their records, songwriters will break their records, whoever is creating music will use these platforms to break their records, all right? And social media will slowly move to the side. Social media will become so integrated with you that it won't even be an app. It, is, it, it will be like an app, but it will be that place where people come in and they'll, they'll say, all right, oh, this is what Casey's doing. Like all the extra names and all that stuff, you know, it may, it may still be around, I'm not sure, but I'm giving social media a max of 10 years before it evolves into just your personal account. It'll be like the ultimate Yelp page on you, okay? Um, so all of these, so the new landscape, like I said, is audio recognition. That's like, hey Siri, hey Alexa, all that stuff. Artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and blockchain technology, which I feel like even though Bitcoin is here, it's way off, but it is starting to infiltrate into the music world and it's being tested on things, but I feel like it's, it's a little ways out. And then wireless adaptations of whatever was wired and everything that was antiquated and things that aren't automated will be automated fully in the future. And everything that, that revolves around creating music will be so condensed and consolidated to where you won't need sometimes these outside sources to handle all of your accounting and your royalty collection and all this stuff. And you'll just need someone to promote. That's what it will boil down to. And artists will have to eventually pay promoters to do everything for both sides of the copyright. All right. So if you all have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the comment section, man. I've been on here for a little minute. Um, it's been a little slow today, but like I said, you all can always catch these recaps online. They'll be available all week, at least from Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, and then now, now that the show is actually named and titled, you will have this podcast coming this week as well. So look out for that. This show is the Music Money Makeover Show. If you have anything to drop in the comment section, go ahead and drop it now. If not, we out. Drop it in my DMs. You can find me on Instagram at Casey Graham underscore 24. And you can find me on Facebook at Casey Graham. Um, I'm in there. All right. Until next time, I'll see you all later. Holla at you. Peace. Whatever it is y'all saying. Later.